Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to take some some ideas from the Pure Bible Study and mix it in with a Watchman broadcast concerning Revelation. I like this. Revelation 13, 13. All right? Uh, Because in Revelation 13, 13, it talks about the... uh, who we know as the false prophet. Uh, he doeth great wonder so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And I'm going to be dealing with that. I've got some, what I think are some interesting ideas on that. And um, just kind of think about all of these so called ministries all over the place that are talking about how fire, they want the fire from, come, to come down from heaven. They want the fire to come down and consume them. They want fire everywhere, because I think that's significant. I think the ministry of the false prophet is to bring fire down from heaven. That's what it tells us in Revelation 13, 13. So we're going we're gonna to kind of do it that way. But I was thinking about pure Bible study, and I was thinking about this idea of the false prophet, and it's interesting. In Revelation 13, 13, Revelation 13 he's not called the false prophet. He is called that in other places in the book of Revelation. We know the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon and so forth sort of make this unholy trinity. It's also interesting, and I've brought this out before, that in Acts chapter 13, you have Paul dealing with a guy by the name of uh, Bar-Jesus, whom he calls false prophet. And I absolutely see that a typology there, and the, the ministry if you want to call it that, of this particular false prophet in Acts chapter 13 is to pervert the right ways of God. He is a perverter. He's perverted. He reads from Bible perversions. He perverts and corrupts the Word of God. And the apostle Paul wasn't afraid of him. He withstood him. And if you remember, Paul cursed him and blindness came upon him and so on. But I got to thinking about this idea of the false prophet instead of the true prophet. Let's think of true prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist, John the Baptist in particular, because I think the false prophet is sort of the opposite of Elijah and John the Baptist. And think of Elijah, who called fire down from heaven and consumed the uh, sacrifice on the altar. So I see a reversal of that in the false prophet. Something else to consider is that John the Baptist, I think, was a prototype of, of Elijah. He, was, he had the spirit of Elijah, and he came before the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he came to prepare the way of the Lord. Something that's interesting to me is in Revelation 13, you have the, the rising up of the beast, the Antichrist, first, Then you have the false prophet not coming before him, but he follows him. And there's some things that I don't quite understand about that, but I think it's significant. I think it kind of shows you the opposite. But I was thinking of this, this other beast that comes up out of the ground, this false prophet, and I started thinking about things in the Bible that are false, And what we're going to do is we're going to just study the Word. We're going to go to Exodus 20. We're going to look at other places in the Bible that deal with false things, because I think this false prophet deals with everything in the Bible that you see that is false. Let me give you an example of that. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. You know in Exodus 20, that's the uh, Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 16, can you think of one of the commandments that has the word false in it? That's pretty good. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, just from a common practical idea, we understand that is don't lie against your neighbor. Do not tell something that is untrue against your neighbor or about your neighbor or to your neighbor. God's people need to deal with the truth. We need to be truthful with ourselves. We need to be honest and open with our neighbors and so on because that's, you know, Jesus gives us the two great commandments that all of the law hangs on, and that is love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. You have to start being honest with yourself. Then you start being honest with the people around you. Why? Because you love them. You care about them. You love them as if you they were yourselves. So there is that, that practical understanding of it. 
But I want you to look at it like this. Think of, um, uh, you know, how we go out and we, our preachers tell us, go out and witness to people. Go witness to them. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. And I am all for that. I think, I think it's the Great Commission. I think it's what we're supposed to be doing, trying to bring followers into the Lord Jesus Christ. And a witness simply tells what they know. But here's something that we absolutely know is going on in these last days. And that is the idea that people are going out and they are saying things about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit that absolutely are not true. They're making claims about God or making claims about Jesus or, or healing. Or they're talking about the miracles that they had in their church, how that angel feathers fell from heaven and gold dust was sprinkled everywhere. That's a false witness, and that is against your neighbor. You are lying through your teeth to your neighbor. You go and you tell whatever the preacher tells you to tell everybody. He's lying. He's sending you out to be a liar, and you are witnessing. You are bearing a false witness against your neighbor. You're trying to get your neighbor sucked into this religious idea that you and your church have and your pastor or your pastorette. You try to get them sucked into this thing, and they go into it, and they realize that it's wrong, that, it, that the claims that you make don't turn out the way you promised that they would. And that person, they're, they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to fall into that same lie and learn how to become the same kind of liar that everybody else is, bearing false witness against their neighbors, or they're going to pull back out of that and say, you know what, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it. And I'll tell you something. A lot of people in the area that I live in, in Missouri, I've talked to a lot of people, just people that I've worked with or people that I've known, people sort of my age and older, who would say, yeah, I used to, my mom, dad used to take me to church when I was little. They, they went to Pentecostal church. And I'll tell you what, they got up there and acted like they've had the Holy Spirit in them and they spoke in all these tongues and they did all this healing stuff. But I knew half of them was adulterers and the other half was a bunch of drunks. And I'll tell you what, if that's what it is to be a Christian, I want nothing to do with it. And I hear that a lot because they went to some church that put on a false witness to everybody and all they saw was the hypocrisy and the lies of people in their church and they said i don't want anything to do with it i don't i'm not going to live my life that way but not not just pentecostal churches fundamental churches conservative churches and churches where everybody there including the pastor is so high and mighty and they act like they never do anything wrong when they are in fact caught doing lots of things wrong, the young people and the people of that church just pull back and say, listen, I went to that church. They all acted like they was better than everybody else, but I knew them. Brother so-and-so was sleeping with brother so-and-so's wife. This, this pastor over here, kept he, he couldn't stay away from the ladies, and they had those testimonies. And what, what church people did was they bore a false witness against their neighbor. And their neighbor now has this view of Christianity that says, I don't need it. If, if they can live like that and claim that God is on their side, I live like that, and I'm just going to be honest about it, and I think me and God will have our own thing going. But they'll, they'll witness a false witness against their neighbor. And I want to tell you something. The more you love the Word of God, the more you get into this Bible, the more you're going to hate false things, false prophets, you're going to hate false witnesses. You're going to hate Exodus 23, 1. The Bible says, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You're going to hate false prophets. You're going to hate false witnesses. And you're going to hate a false report. It's interesting. That word report is in Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah 53 is the prophecy of what happened to Jesus on the cross. It says, Who hath believed our report? Report is the testimony of what God does or how God is or so on. It's sort of related to a false witness. In fact, it is in that verse. And here again, people come out with lies and hypocrisies 
and doctrines of devils, and they're making false claims about God or what God does and how God's going to make them rich and how God's going to make them healthy all the time, and they put out that stuff like it's real, and it's a false report. Don't go bragging about stuff that you're telling everybody God is doing when the truth of it is God is not doing it. Oh, yeah, but I saw somebody healed. Did you really? Did you really? Did you verify with the physician that they were, in fact, healed? Or did they put on a show for everybody, make it sound like they were healed, and you went out and told a false report? Oh, you need to come to our church. They're going to lay hands. Don't you, don't you have back problems? Don't you have cancer? Well, just come to our church, and it would, you'll, you'll get healed of cancer. And so people fall for that. And when it doesn't work, they don't know that there's a false prophet there. They just blame God, and they want nothing to do with it. And I hate that. I hate false reports. I hate false converts. I hate false confessions. I hate false witnesses. I hate them because of the damage that they do. Uh, And keep in mind, the false prophet, and there are many false prophets around us, the false prophet, this is him right here. He is full of false witnesses, false reports. Exodus 23, 7, keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. The false prophet is involved in false matters. Again, this you'll, you'll see YouTube videos of it. You'll see blogs that are bragging and boasting about how they had angel visitations in their church service, and they had gold dust falling down from the ceiling, and that was just a manifestation that that God's visiting angels was there manifesting themselves in their presence, and this is a sign to us that God is about ready to break forth in the supernatural, and he's about ready to bring in a worldwide harvest, and people's going to get rich, and you're going to get all your diseases healed, and all of this stuff. And they're, they're lying through their teeth. They, they're involved in a false matter. And they're not telling the truth. If Christians should be anything, they should be truth tellers. Truth tellers about what the Bible really says. Truth tellers about whether or not God did actually heal somebody or not. Truth tellers about what has happened to them. Truth tellers about who they really are. Because like I said, many people go to church and they put on a false front. They act like they never do anything wrong. They do act like they're better than everybody else because they go to such and such fundamental church and they're King James only or they're this or that and the other and they put on a show in front of everybody like nothing's wrong with them. But I'm telling you something. God is bringing to light in this day and age the false and phony and fake church members who pretended all along that they didn't have any sins because they didn't have a TV in their house or because they didn't listen to country music or at least they told everybody they didn't do that and they didn't attend movies and they only read a King James Bible. These people come out, God is exposing the fake and the phony Christians in this day and age who pretend that they have no sin, but the truth of it is they do. And I think the false prophet is involved, that spirit of the false prophet is involved in all of this. Uh, Again, in Deuteronomy 5.20, he says, "'Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor.'" In Deuteronomy 19, verse 16, The Bible says, if a false witness rise up against any man to justify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, Then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more such evil 
among you. God's pretty serious about this thing. A false prophet rises up or a false witness rises up and he wants to accuse somebody of, let's say he's going to accuse them of murder. He's hoping that they would be killed because they were convicted of murder. And there's to be a trial. And you need to understand this. Where, where is it? Uh, both men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord. You know who's going to judge that matter? God is going to judge that matter. And that's something that I, I think should be in the mind of every believer. I know that it is in mine because I've had controversies with people. I've had people lie about me. I've had people tell the truth about me. But I've had people lie about me. And rather than trying to defend myself, I want God to defend me and God to stand up for me. Because really, that's the only way that we can be cleared is if God says he's innocent. These people over here, they're lying through their teeth, and I'm going to expose them. And, and, and everybody's going to know that if you try to lie before Almighty God, this is how I deal with people who do that. And the false prophet, I think, is going to rise up and he's going to lead church people to be false accusers of those who believe the Word of God, who follow the Word of God, who trust the Word of God, and have not abandoned the Word of God. You see, the fake and the phony Christians, they hate the Bible. Oh, they don't say that outwardly, but inwardly, they do. And they're going after signs and wonders, and they're going after emotions and experiences, and they're going after the doctrines of men. But the truth of it is they hate the Word of God. And the false prophet is going to take those people, I think, and he's going to accuse the brethren falsely. And the Bible's just telling you here, whatever he thought to do to you, I'm going to do that to him. Psalm 2711. The Bible says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Now, this right here is a person crying unto the Lord saying, God, I want truth. Teach me in thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. I want my life to be walking in the path that God directs me in. Deliver me not, oh, this is verse 12, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know how you can tell a false prophet or a false teacher or a false, some kind of false doctrine movement? They'll tell you that God's waiting on you. They'll tell you that, oh, you need to rise. I just got done watching a video. A lady sent me of some False prophet. I can't remember his name. First time I ever heard of him. And in a seven-minute video clip, I hear him promoting works-based salvation and works-based gospel, probably more so than I've heard anybody promote it. He is just like, uh, the Bible tells you to do. You must do. You've got to move. You've got to get going. He even changes the Bible where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. This is pretty good because you know what study is. Study is reading the Word of God and believing the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God, okay? It's not up, you know, power washing the church siding. It's not uh, up doing miracles in front of everybody. It's not up, you know, this and that. That's what study is. Study is just reading and believing and understanding and meditating on the Word of God. And when we study... We believe faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that faith is the essential part on our part of our salvation. You know what he did? Typical of what people do when they don't agree with what the Bible says. They say, now, that word uh, study, really, in the original Greek, here we go, in the original Greek, what the, that word really means be diligent, which means do something. So now, because he's given you the original Greek, he now is going to try to convince you by saying the Bible doesn't teach that if you just study, you'll be approved of God. But if you get up and do something, then you'll be approved of God. That's a liar. That guy's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. And I hate it. 
I hate what he teaches. I hate what he says. And he's telling people, don't wait on God. You go out and do it. There's too many people sitting around in churches waiting on God all the time. God wants you out there doing. That is a works-based blessing or a works-based gospel. And according to the book of Galatians, it's accursed. I wouldn't send that man money. I wouldn't sit in his church for all the tea in China. I wouldn't. And and right here and in Psalm is telling you, Lord, there are false witnesses that rise up against me, and they're breathing out cruelty. And when people lie about us, sure, we want to do something about it. We get mad. Well, I, I'll, I'll go say something about them. I'll go tell on them. Don't do that. You know what you do? You wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know how... Um, Oh, and this guy quoted, uh, I don't know who it was, Smith Wigglesworth or something like that. He quoted somebody that said, when the Holy Ghost won't move me, then I get up and move the Holy Ghost. That sounds real spiritual, doesn't it? That sounds like, yeah, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be moving the Holy Ghost. That's not what Jesus told the the apostles to do. In Acts chapter 1, He told them one word, and that is, wait for the promise of the Father. And so when they were in the upper room, you know what they were doing? Nothing. They were waiting. Although I'm sure they were praying. I'm sure they were thinking on God's word and reading God's word and maybe, I don't know, teaching things. I don't know. But I know that they were there in that room and they were waiting on the Lord. Can you imagine what it would have been like had they gone out into the streets to try to preach before the Holy Ghost fell upon them and gave them the gift of speaking in those languages? Would have been a joke, would have been a mess, probably would have brought about a lot of false converts, but they were told to wait on the Lord, and that is exactly what they did. And I just want to encourage you. I get calls from people all the time. Pastor, I, I, I'm struggling with this issue. I'm struggling with that issue. And I'm, I'm being told that I, I need to step out in faith. I need to do this. I need to take hold of the reins. I need, to, I need to make myself better. And I don't know how to do that. And I don't want to go to hell. I don't know what to do. And I always ask people, did you ask God to remove this from you? Yeah. Did you mean it? Yeah. So what are you going to do now? If you've asked God to remove it from you, why then would you go out and try to remove it yourself? I say, wait on the Lord. You want God to be patient with you, you be patient with God. False witnesses are going to rise up, and they're going to come against you. All you have to do is wait. God will take care of it. Psalm 35, verse 11. Paul's witnesses did rise up, and they laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. There again, false witnesses. Psalm 119, there's two verses here in this chapter that I read them here a while back, and I've just had them in my mind for months now. And... Um, I am I'm in the position in this watchman ministry. People from all over the world are sending me things that happen in their church, things that pastors are telling them, things that they're reading in books, things that they're seeing on YouTube videos. They're seeing the false doctrines and the false ways and the false movements and the false teachings, and they're sending them to me, and I, I get to see all of these, and it bothers me. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why that I am so adamant and so full of hatred toward false doctrine and false teachings and false gospels, and why this guy who went to the original Greek and changed the meaning of the word study to mean get up and do something, why I hate that, why I hate it so bad. It's because every false doctrine, every false gospel, every false movement, every false teacher, every false way, it's becoming more and more easy to identify them. 
All you have to do is just listen to hear them teach about how you must perform. And if you don't perform, you don't do what you're told to do. You don't say the things the right way, using the right words, with the right frame of mind. If you don't perform, then you will not receive from God. And I want to tell you, I hate it. I hate that because of things that I've had to deal with in my life and things that you've told me that you deal with, things that you wrote to me or you called me or you came to this church and visited and said, Pastor, can I talk to you just for a minute? I've got to just share my heart with you. I had somebody call me right after the service Sunday night, and I just, I just felt like God was telling me, answer the phone, answer the phone. Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I'm really struggling with this with this issue in my life and I don't know I don't know what to do. I don't know how to I don't know how to defeat it. I don't know how to get victory over it. You know what I told him? Wait on the Lord. Trust him. Wait on the Lord. You see, performance based blessings, I, I guess they're good as long as everybody can perform what needs to be performed in order to get the blessings. You see, something I've learned in almost 49 years of life, most of that life being spent inside of the church, something I've learned about myself, something I've learned about everybody else. Most of us, if not all of us, really cannot perform what people tell us that we have to do in order to receive God's merit or God's blessing or God's grace or God's forgiveness or God's salvation or God's mercy. We really can't do it. No matter what the requirement is, there's always going to be somebody out there who can't do it. Um, Hannah comes to mind. She was uh, one of the the wives of Elkanah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And the other wife, Penina, she was very successful at having babies. And Hannah couldn't. And it wasn't that she wasn't trying to have a baby. You understand that? She couldn't have a baby. And so you know what? You know what Penina did? Penina never went to Hannah and said, Hannah, I am so sorry. I love you, dear sister. Please take one of my children. I know it's not one of your own, but I would do anything for you for just to have a child. I feel so sorry for you. Panetta never did that. She hated Hannah's guts. She mocked her. She scorned her. And listen to me. The people who pretend to do the works always boast themselves against the people who can't. Always. And I hate it. I hate it when people boast about what they did in the Lord. About I hate it when people boast about what other people do in the Lord. I've been to I've been to Bible conferences, preaching conferences, where it was nothing but the the man praising service. Every time somebody got up, they were praising some other man in the congregation. Bless God. If it wasn't for brother so and so, why I tell you what, we'd just be in a bad mess. If it wasn't for Dr. So and so over here who's Stood faithful all of these. I hate, I just, I told my wife, we went to one and I said, let's go. I can't take it anymore. I hate it. Penina boasted herself against Hannah. And there was Hannah pouring her heart out to the Lord, weeping. God, I want to have a baby. Please, God. And God never said to her, well, just do it. Come on, just rise up and you're you're just obviously don't trust me enough, or you would have one. God never said that to her. I hate I hate the false ways. I hate the false witnesses. I hate the false doctrines and the false gospels because they're cursed. Because the things that the burdens that people will lay on you that you they say you must perform in order to get something from God, more than likely you're going to fail at it. And they're going to boast against you. Here's why I'm saying this. Psalm 119, 104. Through thy precepts, which means his word, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false 
way. Psalm 119, 128 says it again. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. I hate false gospels because they put burdens on people and lock them in bondage by telling them if you don't perform enough, you won't get anything from God. That is not the doctrine of the New Testament. The Old Testament, sure, the Old Testament says do and live. Do and receive. Nobody can do. Only people pretend that they do but they don't really do. Or they may do this, but they don't do that. That's what Romans, uh, Romans chapter 2 and 3 was talking about. Okay, you say you don't commit adultery, but you're a liar. Okay, you say that you don't steal, but you hate somebody. If the man fends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. So while one may say, see, I did this and God blessed me. The problem is they were doing something else against God's law and they're boasting. They're not telling you what they did wrong. They're boasting about what they did right. And I hate it. I hate I hate it when people who have heard the truth of the word of God go out in false doctrine and false ways and follow false teachers. Two young men in my church that for several years preached the truth of the Word of God have fallen into the doctrine, the false doctrine of Finnis Dake. Finnis Dake is the grandfather of the Word, Faith, Name It, Claim It movement, who's teaching in a book called uh, God's Plan for Man. I haven't read all of it, but I go through it every now and then, and I'm just going, oh, I can't believe he said that. Dake's doctrine says that no Christian should ever die of any disease. They should die like Moses, who had all of his life force in him. No Christian should ever be sick and stay in that sickness. They should all die healthy. And Dake equates sickness with salvation. If you are sick, you are not saved. And if you are are saved, then you will never be sick. And if you get sick, you just rebuke it out of you, and you will be whole and healthy all the time, and you should never have any diseases. Because if you have a disease, you're obviously giving praise and glory to Satan, and you're worshiping Satan, and therefore you're not saved. Dake also teaches repeated regeneration, that if you sin one time, you have lost your salvation. Now, you can get it back if you repent. But then if you sin again, all of that old sin comes back on you and you are going to hell again unless you repent. Then if you repent, then you're saved again. That's not, that's a lie. It's the idea that says if you perform enough works and do enough and don't ever do anything wrong ever again, then you'll have a chance at going to heaven. And folks, that's not salvation. And I've lost some friends over Dake's doctrine. And I hate it. I hate false ways. Because really, what is at the core of Dake and other doctrines like this, there's other people who teach and believe this, is what's the idea of sinless perfection. It says, therefore, if you sin, you are going to lose your salvation. Therefore, in order to be truly saved, don't ever sin again. It doesn't work. All that's going to do is, number one, it's going to either breed inside someone who has fallen for that the idea that they can't be a Christian because they can't stop sinning, or it's going to breed a false sense of righteousness in somebody who is even though they still do things that are wrong, they're going to pretend to everybody else that they don't. And I hate it. I hate it. I hate it bad. I hate every false way. Psalm 120, verse 1, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue. You know what false tongue is? 
False tongue is a preacher's telling lies. A false tongue is a, is a church person or a pretend Christian who's bragging about things that God did and God never did it or saying things that God said and God said, I never said that. That's not in the Bible. I never said that. Or a false tongue is someone pretending that they speak in unknown tongues, and they don't. God says, sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. You know what juniper is? It's cedar. Have you ever burned cedar? Cedar burns hot. It's because it's it's got a lot of, it's porous, it's a porous wood. It's got a lot of air pockets, little bitty air pockets in the wood, and it burns hot. And that's what God said. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done to thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Proverbs 6, 16, these six things doth the Lord hate. God hates them. I do too. Yea, seven are abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't tell you this. Finnis Dake, remember him, the guy that says if you are truly saved, you won't ever die of a disease? You know how he died? Parkinson's disease. You know what that is? It's what Michael J. Fox has now, and, if, and, and they just shake uncontrollably. And Parkinson's disease will kill you, but it takes years to do it. Once the diagnosis has been made of Parkinson's disease, they try to control the body movements, okay? But then after a while, the medicine doesn't work. And then a massive amount of pain sets in, so much so that not even morphine can, can knock it. And a person who dies of Parkinson's disease dies years after they are diagnosed, and they die a very painful debilitating, terrible death. That's what Finnis Dake died of. His own doctrine, his own tongue. And I think God allowed him to die of that disease because it takes such a long time. And in all those years, he was never able, according to his doctrine, have enough faith to cure himself. It doesn't work, people. It doesn't work. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. I've had that here. When Dake's doctrine was preached here, it's done behind my back. Sowing discord among brethren, false witnesses speaking lies. Proverbs 11.1, 1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. There's several things I, I, that's interesting to me about this verse. Number one, I think God wants everybody who conducts business of any kind to make sure that they're being honest in the sight of all men and in the sight of the Lord. And that's what a, a just weight is. You have this idea of people bringing in gold and they're going to weigh it out so they can get money for the gold or the silver or whatever it is. And, and the guy who is exchanging the gold for money is tipping the scales a little bit. So it comes out in his favor. And God says, that's an abomination to me. So number one, I think the false prophet is all about false balances and deceitfulness in business. Number two, this idea that says, well, I just kind of believe that when I get to heaven, God's going to weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds. You know what that guy's doing? He is coming up with a false balance because he thinks that his good deeds are really, there. I mean, there's a bunch of them. And all his little bad deeds, they're just a couple things that he's done in life that are wrong. Other than that, he's, you know what he's doing? It's a false balance. It's lying through his teeth. False prophet will teach people that. False prophet will teach people that they are more good than they are evil, like Joel Osteen. Proverbs 12, 17, he that speaketh truth showeth forth kindness, but a false witness deceit. Proverbs 14, 5, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Why do I believe that my Bible is the inerrant word of God? If it's got one mistake in it, it's got lies in it. If 
Nebuchadnezzar saw a son of the gods in the fiery furnace of a truth, then that's what would be in my Bible, but that's not what's there. He saw the Son of God in that fiery furnace. My Bible doesn't tell lies. My Bible does not deceive me by having an error or something that wasn't translated right. And that's what, that's what that false prophet I told you about a while ago. That's what he does. He convinces people that their Bible, where it says, study to show thyself approved, your Bible's not telling you the truth. I am going to tell you the real truth. What that means is God's going to hate you until you get up and do works. A false witness will not lie, but a false witness will, or a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Proverbs 17, 4, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Do you know who listens to false prophets? Wicked doers. You know why their churches are so full and their, and their ministries are so huge and wealthy? Because wicked doers are the ones who listen to false lips. But to the people who were truthful enough about themselves to realize that they were hopeless, reprobate sinners deserving only hell, who went to the cross of Jesus Christ and asked for God's mercy and his forgiveness and his blessing, and for God to do in them what they were incapable of doing themselves. Those are the people who recognize false teachers and false prophets, and they're going, uh, no, that's not right. I'm not going to listen to that. But the reason why false teachers have such a big following is that wicked doers listen to them. That's what it says. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. Proverbs 19.5, a false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. And I'll tell you something. Just because there's people out there that are spreading false gospels and false uh, false doctrines and things like that, and I'm having to learn this. I'm God is trying to teach me this lesson about false teachers with false gospels and false doctrine. God will get them. He don't need me to go punish them. I've had to learn that lesson. Trust me. Proverbs 20, verse 23, divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. There it is again. It's a double witness. Proverbs 21, 28, a false witness shall perish, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. Proverbs 25, 14, whoso boast, here we go, get ready. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Do you know what Peter said? Was it Peter or Jude? Who said about the false prophets that would come and the false teachers? You know what he said? These are clouds without water. You know what they do? They boast of false gifts. Come now, Peter Popoff has got the, uh, God's given him the ability to have words of knowledge about people in the congregation, and he'll call your name out, he'll call your disease out, and when he does, you step forward, and God has anointed Peter Popoff with the healing powers that when he taps you on the forehead, all your diseases are going to be gone. And they actually caught Peter Popoff. Go look this up on YouTube. They actually caught Peter Popoff with an earpiece in his ear. He was pretending to get words of knowledge from God, but he wasn't. His wife was reading prayer cards that people filled out before the show. She was reading the names and the diseases to him through a microphone, and he was hearing them in his earpiece, and then he would call the name, and he would say what they were sick of, and he'd lay hands on them and pretend like he was healing them. And people gave him millions of dollars. And then he was exposed by a... Um, fellow by the name of James Randy. He was a magician, and he sort of did what Houdini did. Houdini went around uh, trying to debunk uh, mystics and psychics and, and uh, fortune tellers and things like that, uh, people holding seances because he knew all the magic tricks. He knew the, how they were doing it. And James Randi exposed Peter Popoff, and Peter Popoff went off the scene. I thought, well, he's done forever. Oh, no, 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 no. He's back. He's back, and he's going after poor people. And he's going after people who are gullible enough to believe that he has the power of God in him, and he's boasting of a false gift. And you know what that is? That's, that's a cloud and wind without any water. 
That's a cloud, big dark cloud that goes by, and you're going, whew, thank God, we need the rain. And all it does is sit there and block the sun, stand in the way of the light. That's all it does. And there are false teachers and false prophets and false Christians out there boasting of false gifts. Oh, God's given me a spirit of knowledge. Oh, I can, I can, oh, I know things about you. The Holy Ghost is telling me that right now. Who, uh, who is this? Uh, the 700 Club, Pat Robertson, getting on there, closing his eyes real tight because you have to do that. You have to, everybody knows that when you're going to get a word of knowledge, you have to close your eyes real tight. Oh, yeah, God's showing me a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma is having back pain. What are the chances of that? A woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma having back pain. Boasting of a false gift, people. They're just like clouds and wind without rain. False prophets of the last days are clouds without water. Proverbs 25, 18, a man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul, a sword, and a sharp arrow. You know what those are used for? To split things up and cut them in pieces. Jeremiah 14, 14, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a, and a thing of naught, which means of nothing, and the deceit of their heart. Why do people lie? Why do false teachers lie to other people? to gain power over them, and to get their money out of them. That's why they do what they do. They want to hold power over people. A lot of them will use that power that they have over people, especially women, so they can sleep with them and then take their money. That's what that is, a false vision and false divination, and I hate it. Three times I asked God to give me dreams and visions. Three times God said, put my nose in my Bible, and he said, here they are right here. And at the third time, I was done asking God for that. God, I will just read your word and believe it. Now, I can tell you, I've had dreams. Oh, yeah. I've had dreams that I thought, man, they're, they're prophecy. I don't trust them. I don't trust them for one second. And if I don't trust my own dreams, why would I trust yours? Especially when I would never even know whether or not you had the dream. You see what I'm saying? How do you prove to somebody that you had a dream? You can't. There's no way. Anybody, anybody can make a YouTube video like I'm making right now and say, God gave me a dream last night, a vision. God, and in this dream, God told me this, and God told me that, and God showed me this, and God said for you to give me $1,000, and have, you have no idea if I dream that. And God says, I hate them. You, uh, you got a false vision and divination, and you've got deceitfulness in your heart. And God said, I didn't send them. I didn't talk to them. I didn't give them words. Jeremiah 23, 32, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. God says, I have no use for them. They're not going to bless the people. Zechariah 8, 16, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these things that I, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. He hates false teachers, false prophets, false doctrines, false gifts, false divination, false dreams, and false oaths. You know what that is? That's you and your neighbor handshaking and making an agreement on something, and the truth of it is you have no intention of keeping your word whatsoever. God hates that. God hates it. False prophet's going to do that. Zechariah 10.2, for the idols have spoken vanity and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain, therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because 
there was no shepherd. Here again, they told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Comfort is a Holy Ghost word. So they're teaching false ideas about the Holy Ghost and what he does. And they're trying to comfort people in vain by giving words of their fake words of wisdom, their fake words of knowledge, and their fake visions and their fake dreams. Instead of what's in the Bible, they're going to give you a bunch of fake stuff that they have to give you a fake spirit that in truth won't comfort you at all. All it's going to do is bring heartache to you. Malachi 3, or worse, drunkenness. Malachi 3, 5, and I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers. That's people who make a false oath. And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Jesus told us, Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There has never, ever, ever been a false prophet that's ever wore a T-shirt saying, I'm a false prophet. Never happened. They always dress up and appear to be Christian preachers, Christian ministers. That's how they appear. They look like they're part of the flock. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. And you say, well, I, 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 boy, I don't know. How, how can I tell whether or not someone is a, is a wolf in sheep's clothing? It's actually real simple. Let's just say that you were looking out, and there was a flock of sheep there, and there was one of those sheep that actually was a wolf on the inside, but it was dressed up just like the other sheep. And you're looking at all of them, and you're going, well, I don't know how I could tell which one's a wolf. It's actually very simple. Just wait till he opens his mouth. Sheep don't sound like wolves. Wolves don't sound like sheep. And all you got to do is wait till he opens his mouth. And then hopefully you'll have some discernment from the word of God about what's coming out of his mouth, whether it actually is in the Word of God, and it sounds like what the shepherd would say. Or you hear it and you go, wait a minute. That's not King James Bible. That's a wolf. How do I know? I heard what came out of his mouth. That's how I know. See, how God makes that stuff so simple, doesn't he? Amen. Matthew fifteen nineteen. for out of the heart... Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. They're in our heart, people. It's a daily fight. Every one of us who truly want to win the prize for Jesus Christ, who truly want to enter into the gates of heaven and have eternal life, it's a daily fight for us to hold back the deceitfulness of and the false witness of our own heart. It's a daily battle. Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Those false prophets are going to be little pictures of the false prophet. Matthew 24, 24, Therefore shall, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. You know why they can't deceive? the very elect. And again, the word very here doesn't mean the higher level elect. It doesn't mean that. It means truly. Very means truly. Okay? When you verify something, you're making sure that it's true. The truly elect cannot be deceived. You know why? We have a shield called faith. And we have a shield that says, I believe every word in my Bible to be the truth. And there isn't one mistake, translational or otherwise. So when the false prophet says, now it says in your King James, study to show yourself approved, but what it really says in the Greek is get up and do something diligently. You're going, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, I'm blocking that in Jesus' name because that is not what my Bible says. And you know it to be truth. You have trust in the written record of the Word of God. 
Uh, Matthew 26, 59, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. They lied, they lied to Jesus. They lied about Jesus, too. They're going to lie about you as well. Matthew 26, 60, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. You know what the problem was there? They couldn't get the false witnesses to agree. They needed two of them, and they couldn't get them to agree. God had sent confusion in among them. You know what that is? You know what that looks like now? The preacher who tells you you need to get multiple Bible translations out so that every so you can see what all the different Bible translations, and I guarantee you there will not be a common theme between them. There'll be false witnesses, and you'll know it. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen for such are false apostles, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Remember, they're going to look like Christians. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Again, all you have to do is just listen to what comes out of their mouth, match it up with the word of God, and if it doesn't match, then what they said is a lie. And I don't care who it is. I don't care what church it is. I don't care if they brag and boast about how they use the King James only. If what they said doesn't match with the written word of God, they're the liar, not the Bible. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, And journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Paul knew that there were people in his church that were lying through their teeth about their salvation. False brethren. They were pretending that they were part of the brotherhood. And Paul said they weren't. And Paul was in peril among false brethren. Because I'm going to tell you something. You got somebody in your church that isn't really a Christian the devil will use them to start trouble in your church. Listen to me, preacher. That's how it works. They pretend to be saved. They're probably even sitting on a board somewhere in the church teaching Sunday school class. They may even be deacons. They may even be the former pastor. I know of a church where the former pastor sat in on a board under the new pastor and then when the new pastor said some things that he didn't like and some other people didn't like and he was preaching the old, old book, the Word of God, that former pastor, a false brother, stirred up a little coup against that pastor and forced him out of his church. If they're not true saints, they're dangerous. And we have false brethren sitting in the pews. We have false brethren leading the singing. Brother Ron Dagonia came and preached to us last Sunday about a church in our county, Baptist Church, where the music minister, who is very talented, has come out as being an open sodomite. And the church thinks nothing of it. Oh, he's, oh, he's saved. He's still saved. You can't lose your salvation now. He's, he's still saved. Mm. I say he never was. Okay? But anyway, that's false brethren. Galatians 2, 3. I'm almost done. Galatians 2, 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in. Here they are. He's mentioning them again. False brethren were brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of gospel might continue with you. You know what I've known over the years, in 20-some-odd years of pastoring, you know what I know? That people will always want, will always want to come in, invite themselves in, become part of the group, and then want you and them to have an open dialogue about how you're wrong. I had a guy that hated what I said about, about an issue. I think he was one of these ultra-dispensationalists, believed in all these different gospels. Eh, not supposed to do that. 
he invited himself to come to sit in this room and do a live Pastor Mike online broadcast so that he could argue with me live in front of everybody. And he basically said, now that I've told you that's what I want to do, you have to do it or you're a coward. (laughs) I'm not going to invite him in to come and sit here and use my microphone and my camera and my internet to tell everybody that I'm a liar. I'm not going to do that. You see, they'll come in to spy out your liberty. And I know for a fact that there are people listening to everything I say so they can try to catch me saying something wrong or something they think is wrong. Listen, I'm already telling you I don't say everything right, and I don't think I understand everything the way exactly God has it laid out in his word, but I'm telling you this Bible is right 100% of the time, and that's what I believe, and that's what I'm telling you to believe. You believe every word in this book. But false brethren will come in, and they always want a piece of the action. They always want to get up on the platform now and have their voice heard. And Paul said, we didn't didn't give place to them. We didn't give them a chance to speak. No way, no how. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, innocent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Listen, people, if it's false, you ought not have anything to do with it. If you're in a church and they're using false Bibles, me personally, I couldn't sit there. I would not sin my children to the Sunday school class or the children's church class or the youth group meeting knowing that they were going to teach them out of false Bibles and teach them false prayer stuff. I wouldn't do it. I won't. I didn't. And I don't think you should either. If you find out that they're telling lies and they're contradicting the Word of God, leave. From such, turn away. Titus 2, 3, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given much wine, teachers of good things. The aged women in the church should be the holy women. We've had some of those women here in our church, and they're, they've passed away, and we miss them. But they were not false accusers. No way, no how. They knew better than that. 1 John 4, 1, beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Many of them. Your responsibility, your responsibility is is to make sure that what you receive into you as far as what's said and what you believe is the truth. And the only way to test that spirit is through the written record of the Word of God. That's the only way, people. Do do people, do God's people still have dreams? I would have to say, according to Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, that yes, I think it's possible. But if those dreams don't match up with the Word of God, the written Word of God, it's a false vision. It's a false dream, and I I won't believe it. Even if I'm the one that dreamed it, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't trust it because it doesn't match the Word of God. You're to test those spirits. And if somebody says, well, you know, God's this way, and you need to believe this doctrine— and you say, okay, give me about, oh, I don't know, five or ten verses in the Bible that spell out exactly what you're telling me. And be careful, because something I learned about wolves, like Finnis Dake. Finnis Dake, in his book, he'll come, you know what he said? Heaven's a planet. God lives on a planet called heaven, just like the planet here on earth. And then he lists all these, I don't know, there's ten Scripture references that he claims backs him up on that. And when you read those verses, you're going, it doesn't say that. 
doesn't say that at all. But he cons millions of people into believing him. I would go to, you know what I did? I checked the scripture references. They didn't say that. So what he said was wrong and it was false. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. You get to where you love the truth, you'll hate every false way. And you just, you just say, I'm done. I'm, and many of you have asked God, God, show me the truth. And God used our ministry or somebody else's ministry to point you to the word of God. And Jesus said, thy word is truth. And you settled yourself right there and you said, I'm done. This is it. My faith has found a resting place. And it's in the old book, the word of God. God bless you. This is Pastor Mike. Thanks for listening to me. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.